Hello friends, it's your buddy Nick here with Game With The Guys. We are joining Speldexia and Irithyll here in Dark Souls 3. And I am a little embarrassed as I start off this episode because we come in here and I said that these were, you know, likely priestesses of the old regime. Well, I, uh, I didn't recognize this figure at first, and it makes sense why I would say that it's a priestess, because this is actually a man dressed as a woman. These are images of Gwendolyn, and <laughs> I was just kind of running through the area, and I was just thinking, like, what? This, this image is so prominent in this area. Who is this? And I kind of thought about it, and it's like, well, who else is prominent in this area? Well, Gwendolyn. And speaking of which, as we uh, come out right here, directly ahead we see Archdragon Peak and the moon. So this, uh, this view right here could mean a lot of different things. It could be representative of Gwyn's two children, or his two sons, I should say, um, and one representing the moon and the other, spoiler alert, is a uh, has befriended dragons or this could kind of be an image of the uh of lothric in a sense um his mother's side potentially being the line of the moon and father's side loving dragons so a couple of different things there down below this ledge we're going to have a couple of of crystal lizards and I like to try to... Oh, I missed him. Oh, well. Not a big deal if you don't get both of them right now. You can always come back. <laughs> so, now that we're here, once again we see this monarch woman image that I presume is the Queen of Lothric. Or probably at this time... At the time of uh, building these structures, or these statues at least anyway, she was probably governing over Irithyll. And then later on, becoming the Queen of Lothric. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about her identity um, as of now in a later episode. But um, as I mentioned, as we last came through this area, I, I, I do believe that, that the image of that, that woman monarch is actually... Uh, the Queen of Lothric. So as we come over here, I'm just checking out my setup here. Let me put on the hawk ring and then we can get a better view of this area. This area is very treacherous and we're going to do our best not to be disturbed as we go through here. I thought that I had my bow out. Up on this path here, there are the priests. These are the devout of the deep uh, deacons, and they are waiting to shoot their pyromancies. I guess they're not technically pyromancies. Maybe they are technically pyromancies. It's weird because these guys kind of cover all bases, both miracles, sorceries, and pyromancies. And if we go through this courtyard here, they will rain their, their fire down upon us. Here we see a bunch of fallen giants. And uh, you you got to believe that at least one of these guys is really alive, right? They're not all dead. Well, we'll find out that, yes, two of them are alive. And here and right here, we have a couple of NPC enemies that are dressed in Drang gear. And so uh, we talked about when we found the Drang armor that uh, this is probably relics from Drang Laic based on the, the Llewellyn set. And uh, Drang Laic did have a history with giants, so once again we are seeing Drang Knights amongst giants. So at this point, what I want to do is actually get past this area. So I am wearing um, the Slumbering Dragon Crest Ring. I've put on Hidden Body, and I will make my way through here. It'll likely run out before I get all the way through, but that's okay. This is going to be the safest way to get through this this gauntlet. Um, there are other ways to get through it. We saw that one of the Drang Knights noticed me as I came invisible. But where I'm trying to go is to this wall here. This is an illusory wall. 
And from here, we can drop down to kind of a secret area below. And by kind of, I mean completely, because it's behind a hidden wall. Those of you that have played the game know that this is one of the most dangerous areas in the game. It doesn't really seem that way because it's wide open and, you know, there's, <laughs> there's only two enemies here. And then back there we have a covenant leader. So what I'm going to do now, let me go ahead. I guess I can just leave this one on. Well, you know what? Let's do this one. Give me a little extra defense. Actually, what I should do is the Lingering Dragon Crest Ring because I'm going to want to turn invisible and I'm going to want to turn invisible for extended periods of time. So this is the easiest way to take care of these Sullivan Beasts. If you turn invisible and you get up fairly close, it's going to take two casts of this staff in order to poison it. Right here we have the covenant item, the human dregs. We'll take a look at this in just a moment, but I want to go ahead and get these guys poisoned so we can talk about some other stuff here. There are a lot of different um, strategies for killing these guys. Uh, this is, like I said, probably one of the most dangerous areas in the game. There he goes. So I want to get out of sight of both of these guys. And as we sit here, the, uh, the counter will tick down and these guys are poisoned. They will die from this poison. That is the easiest way to take care of them. Um, another way that is pretty decent to do is to, <laughs> is to actually get the attention of one and, you know, using, using a bow and bring it over so you're only facing one at a time. And then you can climb up this ladder here and... As you're up above here, you can actually, if you double click the, uh, the run button, so circle on the PS4 that I play on, you can jump down and do a plunging attack on it as you come down. So as these guys are being poisoned, this takes a few minutes, so I've got some time here. I want to talk about the, um, the covenant that we're about to meet here. And I'm not going to talk about the lore of it quite yet, but I can talk about the mechanic of it. It's called uh, Arch. <laughs> it's uh, Archdeacon McDonnell is the one that that leads it, but it's called Aldrich's Faithful. And here we picked up a human dreg. This is the item that you collect in order to turn into rank uh, to rank up in Aldrich's Faithful. This is proof of a duty fulfilled by the Aldrich Faithful, who patiently wait the devourer of God's return. Dregs are the heaviest thing within, within a human body and will sink to the lowest depths imaginable where they become the shackles that bind this world. So here we have that word shackles again, also implying that we are bound to this world, maybe to the will of the gods. This almost looks like the symbol of humanity from Dark Souls 1, um, except for it looks a little deflated. Uh, and that could be because dregs are kind of thought of as the least valuable portion of something or kind of the waste of something. And uh, so this is likely something that, that Aldrich wouldn't really be interested in eating. And so that's, you know, the kind of the leftovers here. And uh, if you want to farm these dregs, actually the, uh, the deacons up above, the devout of the deep, they will drop these. So if you want to farm these and, and rank up in the covenant, um, the other way, obviously, is through the activity of the Covenant. And how it works is um, it's kind of an invasion-based Covenant that is location-locked to this area. So in that sense, it's a lot like the Forest Hunters from Dark Souls 1, um, or the Bell Keepers or Rat Bros from Dark Souls 2. And, or, you know, a, another one would be the Watchdog of Farron here in Dark Souls 3. What will happen is when you wear the, the icon of this uh, covenant, you will um, be summoned when an invader comes into this area. And by invader, I, I don't mean a phantom. I mean a human who is kindled or an embered form coming through and walking through the area. 
and uh, you'll be summoned as kind of a blue and red phantom, and your job is to go and kill the invader. So in that sense, it is almost exactly like the Forest Hunters or uh, the Watchdogs of Farron Keep. And I can show you a little bit of an invasion that I did, just kind of demonstrating here. And um, this covenant tends to be a little bit of a gank covenant. It will continue summoning um, Aldrich Faithful until the uh, until the target is dead. And uh, this this person was very clever and used a seed of a giant. And so I ended up helping them out a little bit by killing the Drang Knights for them. And then uh, the two invaders, um, or the two Aldrich Faithful here, come in and we just were able to um, surround him and, and kill him fairly easily. He put up a very good fight, but like I said, this is kind of a, a gank covenant. And so this area tends to be one that um, people uh, come for, you know, like uh, fight clubs and stuff like that. And now that we have uh, both of the, the Sullivan Beasts here dead, we get what's called the Ring of Favor. And so we can come in here and take a look at this. This is a ring symbolizing the favor of Goddess Fina, whose fateful beauty is mentioned in legend. True to the fickle nature of Fina's favor, her ring increases max hit points, and that's by about 3%. Uh, stamina by about 8% and a maximum equipment load by about 5%. So this is an item that we actually got from Lotric of Kareem back in Dark Souls 1. And a lot of the items around Lotric were um, associated with this goddess Fina. And we'll actually uh, find more of his equipment later on. But um, this version is a little different from Dark Souls 1 uh, in the sense that in this one you can Put this ring on and take it off at will and it doesn't break. In Dark Souls 1, you'd put it on and if you ever took it off, the ring would break. But it it was a very, very powerful ring. This is kind of a, uh, a little bit of a downgraded version of it. But it's still a pretty solid one. Here we have a deep gem, kind of fitting. We're very close to Aldrich and we are very close to his faithful. Here we have a bonfire, and I'm going to go ahead and rest here because I want to reset the area outside. And I didn't really demonstrate, I just realized that I kind of had this here, but I didn't really show you exactly, you know, what we see it doing here. So my, you know, it is kind of a heavy one at one and a half, but um, equipment no load not going to be as high as Havel's ring. But you do get some more hit points there and all of that stuff. And I, I mentioned the percentages before. This is Archdeacon McDonnell. And he is looking fat and bloated and disgusting. And it just kind of seems that his eyes have moss or... Who even knows what coming out of them, but he's very much hollowed out. And as we pray to him, we can ask to join the covenant. And we'll get the covenant item that we can now take a look at. And in this room, you'll notice that there are tons of these statues of uh, Gwendolyn. So let's take a look at this. This is the holy symbol of the Cathedral of the Deep and crest of those who see beyond fire to the age of deep waters, equipped to pledge oneself to the Aldrich Faithful Covenant. The faithful ensure that Aldrich, devourer of gods, remains undisturbed by taking the form of loyal spirits and hunting down those who would trespass the ruined cathedral. Summoning takes place automatically while this item is equipped. So I talked a little bit about the um, the mechanic of the of the covenant. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, this item here. So here it talks about uh, a crest of those who see beyond fire to the age of deep waters. So when we hear about the idea of linking the fire or not linking the fire. All that they really talk about is fire and darkness. And so this line here that talks about deep waters, that's not really something that we think about within um, 
the the universe of Dark Souls. But there is a lot of talk of Deep Waters in Bloodborne, and especially in the DLC. And so there are some that have kind of linked the two that that Bloodborne, um, in a sense, is a a distant future from from Dark Souls, and that could be entirely possible. Um, and all the the Soulsborns game, we do see kind of this idea of curses that that turn uh, regular citizens into monsters. And so that's kind of a an overlying theme. And we do see connections between Demon Souls and, and Dark Souls a lot. And Dark Souls being a spiritual successor of Demon Souls. Um, it's highly possible that Demon Souls actually takes place on, say, the same planet as Dark Souls, but on a different continent. And so they are actually interpreting the, uh, the happenings in a very different way. Um, so it also could be that Bloodborne is on the same planet, but a different continent. And once again, they're kind of interpreting, uh, interpreting the events in a very different way. And like each civilization will have their own gods and myth and all of that, that each one of these places will have their own lore to them. So within this covenant, as you collect dregs and turn them in, um, you'll reach rank one with 10 dregs and you get the great deep soul. And uh, you'll kind of recognize this because this looks like Deep Soul, but this is a stronger version of it. Um, let's see. So the description reads, Sorcery which uh, improves upon Deep Soul fires powerful darkened soul dregs. So I talked about dregs being kind of worthless. I guess they do, they do have some use here. Um, Archdeacon McDonnell is a sorcerer himself. Delighted in the cathedral's stagnant, uh, stagnating souls. For him, they represented the glorious bedrock of the world. And so he he loves getting these dregs. And so as you uh, give those to him, that's how you rank up. And I guess he kind of views these uh, these dregs as the kind of the building blocks, the, uh, the salt of the earth, <laughs> if you will. And if you uh, collect 30 dregs, you will get Archdeacon's Great Staff. A large staff bestowed upon archdeacons of the Cathedral of the Deep. The Archdeacon MacDonald's trespass, the sin of channeling faith for sorcery, transformed what was once merely a symbol of ecclesiastic authority into a catalyst of sorceries. So ecclesiastic means relating to the clergy, of or relating to the clergy. And this staff scales with faith rather than the sorcery, as the description implies. So um, we saw with, with Gwendolyn back in Dark Souls 1 that uh, his Dark Moon Catalyst would scale with faith in order to, um, or actually it scaled with intelligence in order to do faithful things. Maybe I have that backwards, but his, uh, he would use things that were magic, but based on faith. And uh, so this, well, I guess they are kind of similar. This. This, <laughs> this staff, um, although I've, I've got it kind of messed up here because uh, Gwendolyn was a faith-based person that did magic damage. This is actually a sorcery catalyst that scales on faith. So similarities, but, you know, kind of two different sides of it here. And, you know, looking at the covenant, we know that... Um, uh, the McDonnell actually came here to follow Aldrich, and if we look back at the uh, the description of, hopefully I, oh, I don't have it in my inventory, maybe I have it over here, but if we look back at the description of the Archdeacon set, um, and we can look here at the helmets here, here it is. So, uh, the white crown worn by an archdeacon of the Cathedral of the Deep. Of the three archdeacons of the Deep, one cast off his white crown and left the cathedral to stand by Aldrich. So, he's given up on the faith that was originally part of uh, the Cathedral of the Deep. And we also know that Klimt did a very similar thing by standing by Rosaria. And you see that he wears no crown. Royce, though faithful to Aldrich, still wore his crown, as we saw when we fought them. But um, McDonald is a little bit different. And uh, I, I kind of think that this covenant is McDonald's little 
fanboy homage to Aldrich. I don't think that Aldrich really cares at all that um, they're here. He might think that it's, you know, hey, it's a little useful that these guys are trying to kill these people that are that are coming to find me, but I don't think Aldrich really cares at all. <laughs> so now as we come back up here, um, this is a super tall ladder. And if you drop down from too high, this will kill you even with um, spook or the silver cat ring and I'm just amazed that I'm not at a top yet here we are all right so I um, I say this many many times but I have a very particular way of going through this level and I believe that this path well for me anyway is the easiest path to take and um, probably leads to the least amount of trouble there's a Titanite scale over here and there's a very particular reason why I'm, I'm using this building as cover, and we'll see in just a moment here that, well, can we see him from here? You can just see the top of his head, but there are silver knights that are stationed up on this ledge here. So that'll remind you a lot of An Orlando from Dark Souls 1, these, these silver knights with their great bows that were just waiting to, uh, to shoot people down on their way up and into uh, in Orlando. So using stealth, I can get by completely unharmed, and we'll find the Easterner's Ashes. And I just wanted to pick that up quickly and get over here so that I know that none of these guys will be, uh, will be spotting me and shooting me down. The Easterner's Ashes are umbral ash of an armor merchant from an eastern land. Surely the handmaid of Firelink Shrine can turn this into a few new things. The merchant, the captain of a clan of hunters, was fascinated with weaponry. So we talked a little bit about the, the hunter clan from Dark Souls 1, and so this seems that this is talking about Shiva of the East, or perhaps some sort of spiritual successor, some lineage of taking up his uh his you know his his duty or his uh his job really so what this will unlock is uh moss fruit large titanite shards the washing pull eastern iron shield eastern armor set dark arrow honest slayer great arrow and the wood grain ring um and we'll talk more about those items as we get back to um to firelink but um it's kind of an, an interesting grouping of items, and it's one of the, uh, one of the larger uh, sets of things that's unlocked from, from finding some ash. You can uh, backstab these guys and knock them down, or I wanted to take a little bit more damage off of them that way, because um, these guys will fall and survive, and they'll land on the next level. And I just wanted them to have as little amount of hit points as possible. Right around this corner we have another guy that's just waiting to... Oh, he's trying to get that backstab. Where's that backstab? Give me that backstab. And, oh. Here we go. That's usually just the easiest way to take care of these guys, is to get in that backstab and uh, wait for them to stand up, and then you can just kind of hit them with, <laughs> with whatever as they're getting up. Um, I want to reapply this. We've got a couple more of these guys here. And if you're not careful, this one over to the side will hear you as you, uh, as you attack his friend. And you'll see that they're... They, uh, they tend to drop these uh, Titanite shards. These guys are a little bit easier when they have their bow out because... Oh, dang. <laughs> well, um, I did want to come down here eventually, but not quite yet. So we get the Titanite shards. We get the Dragon Slayer Great Bow, which I suppose I can go ahead and take a look at. Um... The great bow used by dragon slayers during the Age of Gods, far greater in size than any normal bow, and far more devastating. This is obviously, this is the bow that the Silver Knights are using. 
The bow must be anchored to the ground when fired, a time-consuming operation that leaves the user vulnerable. Only specialized great arrows can be fired from the bow. And you see that it does have pretty solid strength and dexterity requirements, and it does good physical damage. It weighs a lot, and it does big, big knockback, as you saw it knock me down. We can also look at the corresponding arrows here. Large spear-like arrows created by the giant blacksmith of the gods. And these kind of look a lot like the, the arrows that um, the giant of the undead, uh, I almost said undead covenant, of the undead settlement was shooting. Um, he, uh, created by the giant blacksmith of the gods. Uh, can only be used with great bows. These large arrows are said to have been used by dragon hunters during the Age of Gods. Easily pierces human flesh. But they, um, they are large. They are very strong physical, but no lightning damage, which is kind of surprising because they are the, um, the arrows used for dragon hunting. So you would think that, that they would uh, have some kind of lightning imbuement. And now I'm just going to take the time to run back up to where we were um, because this <laughs> kind of messed up my, my regular path of, of where I run. So let's just get back up to where we were. Okay, from here, I normally take this path down to this section of tower and bridge area here. And you'll want to be careful because there are still the Silver Knights that are firing. Um, the first one that we located... Oh, well, he found me. <laughs> I thought that I was safe from him. I am not. And so you walk around and you just have a giant arrow stuck through your abdomen. But coming down here will open up a shortcut, and I'm just going to open this door. I'm not going to go through it at this time. Here we are there. And you could actually hear some of the, uh, some of the deacons outside throwing fireballs. And this route did kind of mess me up. It, it threw me off a little bit here. Normally I would come and jump over here, and we've got, oh man, he's already looking at me, which is no good. Hopefully, um, oops, how about this, this button here? I didn't mean to hit that twice. And these guys, uh, won't have a lot of hit points left, so I can just kind of run up and take care of them. But they were in a position, they were in a good position for sniping, and uh, that can be pretty problematic for the next stuff that I want to do. Um, I'm going to leave the last one up there. He's, it's not a big deal that he's there, but um, normally this is when I would come down and grab that bow, and then we can come back down through here. And that guy can still kind of see me, but... Oh, you weren't supposed to find me yet. Well, time to kind of change up my, my game plan here. Normally I sneak up behind these drag knights, or drag knights, but this guy has found me, so I'm going to just bring him somewhere that's a little bit more safe for me to fight. And they've both found me now. Well, yeah, like I said, normally I would um, kind of use... Use a little stealth to get to these guys, but um, but we're going to have to change things up a little bit. And these guys, at, at least when you uh, fight them with your with twins, twin weapons, and oh jeez, oh man, that is not what I want to happen. This went horribly, horribly wrong. I'll have to show you how how fake did it. He just walks up right behind them and just stabs them in the back and, and kills them fairly easily. Um, these guys are a little bit... Oh, come on. These guys, I think, are a little bit easier than, than some of the... As I just completely get trashed by these guys. If you're fighting one at a time, they're a lot easier than a lot of the NPC phantoms. You'll see that this guy is using the Drang Hammers. And this guy is using a new weapon 
called the Drang Spears. And you'll notice that their weapons were glowing purple. And uh, we talked about how um, Drang Laic was associated with the darkness of Nashandra. So these guys are using these uh, uh, a dark enchantment or... Oh man, that guy already sees me. They're using a dark enchantment or, you know, a dark buff in order to, um, <laughs> in order to do more damage. But hopefully that guy will kind of leave me alone here. We can take a look at this. This really just has a similar um, description to the Drang Hammers. So there's not really any new lore here. But this is, all, this is kind of the first time that we see them using that, that uh, the dark buff. So if things go the way that they're supposed to, you can normally come down here, and I don't think that I need my silver cat ring anymore, so I can use this to uh, gain back some health here. These guys aren't paying attention, so you can just kind of come back and go through here and systematically just kill all these guys. <laughs> they're not paying any attention. And obviously, you know, I am using the slumbering dragon crest ring so um, my sound is is uh, muffled quite a bit, but you can get the same effect just by tiptoeing or walking very slowly. You have to be very careful that you get... Yeah, you can just see only one knows where I am. Well, now two. But these guys are just so obnoxious. Just imagine with all... I think there's maybe around ten of these guys with all of these guys firing away at you. Just how annoying this can be. And these guys, they don't have a lot of poise. You can just knock them down like that. But, yeah, so... Ugh. <laughs> it's not the way I wanted it to go. Usually I have a little bit more Estus, but I've pretty much cleared out the area. So we can uh, run over here and grab this item. Some more Titanite over here. And we can open up a uh, another shortcut. And while we're standing down here, we can look up above. And that is the main cathedral from An Orlando. And we'll get a up-close and personal glimpse at that a little bit later on. But while we're in here, this is the shortcut that will lead back down to Pontiff Sullivan's boss room. And if we come over here, there will be a crystal lizard in hiding. And once again, the uh, the slumbering dragon crest ring allows me to sneak up on it much easier. This gives me a simple gem. Uh, we've talked about that before, so I won't go too much into it. Other than, you know, Sullivan was a sorcerer initially. So it makes sense that we'd find a sorcery based um, gem here. Over here, we have a mimic. And hopefully, I have. I do. I have two of these guys. So let's just go ahead and we can buff up here. Put that away. We can toss our undead hunter charm. I could reach in and grab the item now, but. Why not just kill the Mimic? So, without it even waking up, I did almost 1,800 damage to it. 1,750, I think, was the number. And now we will get the Golden Ritual Spear. And we can take a look at this here. Ritual Spear presented to Dark Moon Knights before Sullivan claimed the title of Pontiff. So this doesn't really give a timeline as to when um, Sullivan declared himself Pontiff, but um, I think that this is actually the first place where we see that he is self-proclaimed Pontiff. Uh, he took, took the title himself and then took over this area, it seems. Um, but this, this was an item from before that time, but once again, we don't really see a timeline. This can also be used as a staff, and uh, uh, sorceries cast using this weapon channel the wielder's faith. So we see that it has a, a strong um, intelligence requirement, but then the scaling is done with faith. And so the magic there 
Um, magic damage is a split damage type. And if we, I don't know that I can actually use this here, but yeah, this would, yeah. So this cast sorcery is there, but then here you get steady chant. So we've seen a few, a few weapons do similar things here. And this is actually gonna be a, um, oh, I forgot about one important thing down here. A few important things. Oh, I didn't realize that I took off my silver cat ring. Oh, well. I don't need this anymore. We see some Irithyll slaves hanging out over here, or the semi-invisible Irithyll slaves. But we've got one there that uses magic. And he'll shoot right over your head if you're right up in front of him, like you just saw. This guy you can't target until he starts to wake up. And you can probably hear me clicking, but we can go ahead and take care of that guy. What did you drop for me? Blood gem. That's their little candy, as we talked about before. Here we have the dark stone plate ring. So fitting, we're finding the idea of darkness here because of Aldrich being here, Sullivan being here. And so we find this item that will increase dark damage absorption. Um, these uh, stone plate rings all have very similar descriptions. This one says that they are granted to undead knights. And this will increase your absorption. I don't think that it'll properly show it here because my dark absorption is kind of high already, but this will do 13 points uh, added to your absorption. So a lot of the items, and I've discussed this before, they kind of um, kind of taper off as your absorption goes up above uh, maybe like 20, 25%. So over here is what appears to be a graveyard of giants. And there's a couple of ways of taking care of these guys. Um, they're not particularly difficult, but if you want to be as safe as possible. Oh, and I just knocked them down. Getting a lot of quick hits on them will, will kind of stun lock them. Oh, and I just killed that one. You see, they're pretty quick. <laughs> and they'll drop Titanite shards. Here, I think this is an ember. Oh, no, that's a soul. There's an ember somewhere over here. We got one more of these guys, and... Um, so they'll get kind of stunlocked like this, and you can just go up and do a, a critical attack on them. And, yeah, that killed them. There's the ember. This will be Titanite. Uh, if you want the easiest way possible, you can shoot them from a distance. They can't climb up these stairs. <laughs> so you can actually just let them stand right there and shoot them with a bow from here. Or if you haven't killed all of the uh, the deacons up above and they're still shooting fire at you, you can trigger these guys to get up and you can actually hide under the bridge over here. And they can't, they can't get through this doorway, so you can just stand here and shoot them from this location also. So, these giants we see are wearing chains, they are shackled, they've got the pins in their legs used for holding them in place. Why are there giants here? And if we think about the other places that we've found giants, uh, the Undead Settlement, we found them in Irithyll Dungeon, we found them in the Cathedral of the Deep. All of these places have been kind of a path uh, of places that are associated with Aldrich. Um, places, um, the path, you know, they're protecting the path leading to Aldrich, leading to clues of Aldrich, and um, also places that are, in a sense, um, kind of associated with, with Sullivan. So, um, 
we'll see we'll see more evidence of this as we go but the two of them are are kind of uh helping each other out here and uh well as we saw with with Sullivan's soul it, it talked about um having having the god to uh to give to the devourer and so that is that's probably our first evidence of the two of them being associated but um we're we're seeing more and more clues of these guys teaming up together and i thought there was an item over here but it was just reflection on the uh the brightly colored snow so at this point we can run back up to um the location that we were before and i can't climb walls apparently but uh, at this point, I can say thank you for watching. If you did not realize that this was a statue of Gwendolyn, uh, you can go ahead and like this video. Or if, you're, you know, if you enjoyed the video, if you learned some new strategies or some new lore here, I appreciate the likes. If you're enjoying the, the playthrough, uh, you can share this with your buddies if you think they will like it. And uh, if you have any questions about some of the lore that I've talked about, or if you think that I'm just totally wrong, I like to hear all, you know, differing opinions. That is also one of the cool things about all of these games is that um, everyone is entitled to their own opinion. Everybody will interpret the lore differently. So it's very possible that your interpretation of the lore is different from mine. We'll see statues of Silver Knights here. This was a prominent design in An Orlando and also in Anne Orlando, we found a large statue of Gwyn. And this is that very same Gwyn. And like that statue of Gwyn, there is a secret wall behind here. And this will be very different um, for Fake's playthrough. And I'll, I'll show you that in a future episode, but... Um, Right now, what we find ourselves looking at is the boss room, uh, Gwendolyn's boss room from Dark Souls 1. And here we get the, the brass set, and we can take a look at this. Armor of a knight once known as the Dark Moon. Uh, it is said that this brass armor hides something hideous within. Something about its silhouette suggests femininity. And as we put this on... Um, we can talk a little bit about the Dark Moon Knight. This is what she looked like. There is a silhouette of femininity because this was a a woman's armor set, though it could be considered a little bit of a femininity to it because this armor was also kind of associated with Gwendolyn, who we're going to get a little bit more lore about over here. But... Um, Gwendolyn, because of his strong association with the moon, and the moon was believed to be kind of more of a a feminine um, icon. So his strong association with the moon uh, made it so that Gwyn actually raised him as a daughter. And if we look at the reversal ring here, we can see, I'll first demonstrate what it does, and it will change your stance to look more like that of the opposite sex. So this is my normal female stance, and then I put it on and it's the male stance. So that's really all that it does. This item, um, <laughs> well, let's, let's take a look at the description of it here. Oh, I wanted to hit this button instead. A divine ring granted to the dark moon Gwendolyn in his youth causes males to perform female actions and vice versa. Gwendolyn uh, was raised like a daughter through the aura of the moon and was said to behave like a sullen brooding goddess. I didn't realize that Gwendolyn was so emo, but we, uh, emo confirmed, we get evidence of it here. Um, and uh, I was talking about this armor and, and the Dark Moon Knight that wore this. Uh, she was also a firekeeper, and we've talked a lot about firekeepers and their um, affliction. I don't know what else to say, but uh, the firekeepers, their souls talked about having a just writhing mass of humanity just below the flesh. And so it kind of would 
make this deformed, disgusting look on their skin. And uh, so this brass armor hides something hideous within. And that was actually the, uh, the look of the firekeeper. And the firekeeper's writhing humanity within her chest. And all firekeepers are female. So we can just come up here and, well, there's really a lot more to do, but I'm going to stop it once we get to the, to the edge here. Because this is the very end of Irithyll. And we'll find here an ember. We'll notice that there is a tower here that connects to, that's Yorshka's church right there. And as you come around, there's Sullivan's boss room over there and Irithyll down below. And those of you that have played Dark Souls 1 know all about the staircase that spins and twirls like this. And it'll give you a little notice that it's a about to be finished turning, but um, yeah. That's going to do it for this time. Uh, we're going to continue on into An Orlando in the next episode. And we've got lots of good stuff coming up. So much interesting lore. And as I've said before, I have an interpretation of what's going on here that I haven't really seen a lot of people or really anybody discussing before. Um, and honestly, I wasn't like trying hard to find something new. It was literally the way that it unfolded as I was reading the item descriptions. So um, we'll talk more about that as we, as we go up into Anorlando. But until then, thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.